Life of Yato, Noragami. Yato is one of the main three protagonists of Noragami. He is an obscure god who considers himself a god of fortune. In the past, he was known as a god of calamity. Yato's dream is to become a famous god whom everyone worships. Welcome to the Amagi! In today's video, we're going over the life of Yato. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel. So if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Background. Like all gods, Yato was born from a wish. However, unlike most gods who were created to help humans, he sprouted from father's wish to kill every god in existence. He was given the name Yaboku, and he tried to do everything to make father happy. Sometime later, he was introduced to Nora, and he named her, thus making her his Shinki. Together, both of them often went out to kill people under father's orders. Yato met Sakura when she approached him under a cherry blossom tree, asking him to give her a name after she was dismissed by Tenjin in a fit of rage. He didn't get to immediately name her because he jumped on her and groped her breasts. He saw her again after he threw her onto a spring, saving her from blight getting worse. She asked for his name and he wrote it down. However, she mistook his name as Yato. It was Sakura who gave him the name he was using today instead of his given name by father, which was Yaboku. Later on, Sakura became his first Shinki besides Nora. His relationship with Sakura didn't start well. Surprised and bothered by the onslaught of memories he received from her, which he didn't get from Nora, he threw her once again in the spring and left her there for three days. When he did get back, he and Sakura went to the market. There, he got scolded by Sakura for stealing. He tried to calm her anger by giving her flowers. And then, he and Sakura went to see the fireflies. This is where their relationship strained once again. He called her and used her to kill a man. The despair that Sakura felt traveled to Yato and caused him pain. He wasn't able to reconcile with her until a while later on. Then, Sakura told him about the shrines and he dreamed of having one too. The time he spent with Sakura made Yato see the lines between good and evil acts, and he started doubting if what he was doing was good. Nora approached him one day, and she said that father was punishing her. Yato was shocked about this and brought her to the spring to heal her. There, Sakura and Nora finally met each other. Sakura tended to Nora and asked her how long she served Yato, wanting to learn more about her master. This was when Nora encouraged her to ask Yato about how she died or her past. Yato refused, knowing that doing so would violate God's greatest secret. However, Nora told him that father said it was okay. Yato then told her and Sakura became an Ayakashi. This transformation blighted Yato and Sakura attacked him. Then he was forced to finish Sakura off with Nora. A house cat, a stray god, and a tail. Mutsumi is sitting in her classroom, enduring the bullying of her classmates when she sees a phantom outside her classroom window. She prays to God to save her and Yato and his Shinki, Tomone, are seen on top of a water tank, where Yato flips a 5 yen coin in response to Mutsumi's wish. Tomone then comments on the size of the phantom, to which Yato responds that it's exam season, therefore everyone is on edge. Yato then jumps off the tank aiming for the phantom, calling Hanki as he jumps. Yato then destroys the phantom with Tomone in the form of Hanki using ritual words to rend the phantom. When the battle is over, Yato reverts Timone back to her human form, and she comments on Yato's cocky behavior and how sweaty his hand was. She tells Yato that she wants to quit, after which Yato interjects that they've only been working together for three months, then starts to cry. Yato, unable to stop her tears, agreed to release her. After her release, Tomone's real feelings towards Yato surface, and she parts with a few taunts and no respect for Yato. After painting his cell phone number on a wall in a park, Yato eventually receives a call about Milord being missing. It turns out that Milord is, in fact, a missing cat. Hiyori Iki is with her friends Ami and Yama as they see a poster of Milord and comment on how some people give weird names to their pets. 
As the girls are talking about people they like, Yato is yelling out for Milord. As he is looking for Milord, he walks past Hiori, who notices him. Yato then notices the cat in the middle of the road and chases it right into the path of an oncoming bus. However, he is pushed out of the way by Hiori, which results in her not getting hit. Hiori awakens in her family's hospital, where her mother wants her to spend the night. Hiori then asks where the boy was, to which her friends Ami and Yama both comment on there being no one, and that she ran out onto the road. She is awakened by the voices of phantoms later that night, and is horrified to find Yato hiding underneath her covers, to which she then jumps out of the bed with cat-like reactions. After telling her that she is the first human to ever have saved him, Yato introduces himself as a god, although Hiori does not believe him at first and starts to call the police. Yato then begins to tell her of his dream, to which he then daydreams. Yato then asks Hiori her name, which she tells him, covering her mouth soon after. Yato then leaves via the window, telling her that he made sure that she was okay, so that now they're even. Hiori meets her friends at school, who asks if she's better from the accident, to which she replies that she's fine. Hiori then almost collapses from drowsiness, telling Ami and Yama that lately she's been getting drowsy suddenly. Hiori then finds herself beginning to forget about Yato in the ordeal with the bus, but her memory partially returns after she sees one of Milord's missing posters on the street. She resolves to find the cat in order to completely remember what happened to her. Meanwhile, with the help of some catnip, Yato manages to find and catch Milord. However, he is then attacked by a phantom that Milord had been teasing. Forgetting that Timone had quit on him, Yato charges the phantom, but Hiori appears and pulls him out of its path, saving him again. After Hiori successfully attacks the phantom, the two run away and manage to lose it. As the pair catches their breath, Yato points behind Hiori at her tail and informs her that her soul has slipped out. They locate her body on top of a fence, and Hiori suddenly collapses back into her body, losing consciousness. Yato successfully returns Milord to his home and begins carrying Hiori back up to her house, but she wakes up and hits him, calling him a pervert. He finally explains about her being stuck in between the far shore, or the afterlife, and the near shore, where the living reside. Hiori then asks for his help to fix her body, seeing that he's a god, and Yato agrees but requests money in return. Hiori mistakes the cost for 50,000 yen, and then 500,000 yen, but Yato tells her the correct amount, 5 yen. Episode 2 Hiori leaves her body while bathing, and again later at school while changing for gym class. As her friends Ami and Yama carry her to the infirmary, Hiori decides to wander the city, as she's able to move faster in her half-phantom form, and she eventually ends up in a park. Yato, who is writing his number on a train, receives a call from Hiori, who doubts his claims that he is a god because he has yet to help her. He appears next to her suddenly, having teleported, and states that if he weren't a god, he wouldn't be able to do that. When she asks him about a request, he tells her that he cannot do anything without a shinki. He then gets a call asking for help and disappears. Hiori then takes it upon herself to find a shinki for him, looking around town and talking to several small phantoms. She finally notices a storm, a large group of phantoms brewing in the distance, and reasons that since there are so many spirits headed towards the storm, at least one of them will listen to her. Meanwhile, it turns out Yato's call was about cleaning a bathroom, where he receives his 5 yen payment and a can of beer. As he's about to turn in for the night, Yato gets another call from Hiori, who claims to have found him a shinki. He appears before her once again, only to find that the so-called Shinki she found was actually a large phantom. The pair then proceed to run away from the creature. When Hiori tries to attack the phantom, she is stopped by Yato, who is then bitten on the arm by the phantom. He manages to injure it, causing the phantom to temporarily retreat. Yato prevents Hiori from touching his injury, explaining that his arm has been blighted, which is a type of defilement that spreads around unless it is exercised or cleansed and slowly eats away at you. Yato then explains that Hiori's tail is not actually a tail, but a cord that connects her physical and ethereal forms. Therefore, if it is cut, she will die. The phantom reappears, and they have no choice but to run from it once more. Suddenly, Yato catches sight of an uncorrupted spirit in the distance and stops dead in his tracks. 
He identifies it as a teenage boy, which he says is a typical age, but claims it as a Shinki anyway. It transforms into its weapon form, a katana. Yato then sees a flashback of the spirit's memories and stands still on top of the power pole, seemingly in shock, and starts to collapse. He is then swallowed by the phantom, katana in hand. Hiyori screams his name, and Yato, inside the phantom, opens his eyes and slices the creature open from the inside out. He plummets through the air, lands on a pair of power lines, and then falls to the ground. He lies on the ground for a moment, and Hiyori sees tears running down his cheeks. Later, he is cleansing the blight with the katana propped up beside him. He tells Hiyori that the katana's name is Yuki, and less formally, Yukine. The katana then reverts to his human form, a teenage boy with blonde hair and orange eyes. Seeing that Yukine is shivering, Yato offers him his jersey top. However, he is rejected by Yukine, who states that it reeks of sweat. Hiyori then offers Yukine her scarf, and Yato stares off into the distance with a blank look on his face. Bidden Calamity Yato digs through a charity dumpster to find clothes for Yukine to wear, while the latter wonders why he can still feel things around him even though he's already dead. After their would-be lunch is stolen by a stray cat, Yato calls Hiyori to treat him and Yukine to a meal. In the restaurant, the waitress takes Hiyori's order, but fails to notice Yato and Yukine until they speak directly to her. Yato then explains to Hiyori that although people have the ability to see them, they rarely notice them and forget them almost instantly due to being from the far shore. Hiyori speaks with Yukine while waiting for Yato to exit the restaurant, and he tells her that although he knows he died, he cannot remember anything about his life prior to becoming Yato's Shinki. Yukine then has a dirty thought about Hiyori, which results in Yato experiencing a stab of pain as he exits the restaurant. Yato chastises Yukine and tells him that gods and Shinki share the mind and body, so he can sense all of Yukine's sinful thoughts. Yato then receives a call from a client and teleports off with Yukine, accidentally bringing Hiyori in her half-phantom form along. The three of them end up at the shrine of Tenjin, the god of learning. Tenjin explains that he contacted Yato to have him kill some phantoms at a nearby railway track, and then calls upon his newest Shinki Mayu, Yato's former Shinki Timone, to show them the way. After briefly arguing with Yato, Mayu leads them to the railway and explains that the area is plagued by storms, which allows the phantoms to possess people and make them commit suicide on the tracks. Hiyori is determined to defeat the phantoms, but Yato declines and says that if a person wants to die, they should let them die. He then goes on to explain that once a soul has been completely possessed, it can't even become a Shinki. This infuriates Hiyori, who then goes off on her own to try and defeat the phantoms herself. Yato is about to leave when Mayu reminds him that he'd already accepted Tenjin's money, and Yukine chimes in to ask if it's okay to let Hiyori go off by herself, eventually convincing him to take the job. Meanwhile, Hiyori attempts to kill a phantom on the shoulder of a schoolboy by kicking it, but is overpowered and captured by the other phantoms, who then tie her to the tracks in the path of an oncoming train. She is saved by Yato and Yukine, who then manage to kill another phantom at the railway crossing and prevent a schoolboy from committing suicide. As the sun sets, Hiyori catches up to Yato and Yukine and expresses her pleasure at the fact that the former decided to help people after all. However, Yato shrugs off her praise and tells her that he refuses to let anyone die in front of the Shinki if he can help it, and that people should appreciate what it means to be alive at all. Hiyori then recalls how young and innocent all of the Shinki are, and realizes that if suicide isn't how they died, then Shinki are all people who must still want to live. Later, at one of Tenjin's shrines, Yukine wakes up due to the cold, and Yato throws him the Kapipa land jacket, which he had gotten from the charity bin, telling him that he'd done well for his first job. As Yukine lies down to sleep, a young girl is seen at the entrance of the shrine looking at the two of them. Where happiness lies. Yato has a dream about being a rich and famous god, but Yukine ends up kicking him down the stairs in the middle of the night for being too noisy. In the morning, Hiyori brings them both lunchboxes in an effort to get Yato to finally listen to her request. However, instead of listening to her, Yato shows off several items that are supposed to make his dreams of being a famous god come true. The items are obviously scams, and this leads to Hiyori getting angry at Yato and telling him to pull himself together for Yukine's sake. Yato then decides to take Hiyori and Yukine to meet Kofuku, 
whom he introduces them as his girlfriend. Yato then attempts to scam Kofuku, much to Hiyori and Yukine's chagrin, but is kicked into a wall by Kofuku's extremely protective Shinki, Daikoku. The three of them are invited in, but Yato is sent flying again after telling the others that Daikoku likes to stare at children. Over tea, Kofuku reveals to Hiyori and Yukine that she heard about Yato through some bad rumors and calls him a scary god. Suddenly, Yato appears and informs Yukine that they have a job and drags him off with Hiyori following closely behind. It turns out that the call made to Yato was a mistake. It was actually a wrong number dialed by a young man standing atop a tall building who wanted to call his parents before committing suicide. Unfortunately, Yato appears directly above the young man and lands on him, knocking him off the building. As the four of them begin the long fall down the side of the building, the young man, whose name is Yusuke Urasawa, decides to tell them his story. Yusuke explains that he met a girl from an overprotective and overbearing family a while back, and the two of them began dating. However, as he took her out on more and more dates and bought her more and more gifts, he began to fall into debt and eventually became broke. Since he could no longer support her, he decided to end his life. After listening to the story, Yato asks him for a picture of the girl. Yusuke produces a photo of Kofuku, much to Hiyori and Yukine's surprise. Yato then explains that Kofuku is actually Binbugami, the god of poverty, who brings misfortune wherever she goes, and that Ebisu is merely a professional nickname. Yato offers to sever Yusuke's ties to Kofuku, but he refuses and claims that he would rather die than forget her. Yato punches Yusuke, grabs him by the collar, and tells him that anyone who chooses to kill themselves isn't cut out for love. He then uses Yukine to sever Yusuke's ties, and Yusuke lands gently on the pavement with Kofuku's number deleted from his phone. The three of them return to Kofuku's home, where Daikoku chastises Kofuku for going out without telling him. Daikoku then states that cutting bonds is no easy thing, especially for a first-timer, causing Yukine to become embarrassed, and Daikoku then compliments Yato on his shinki. He then pays Yato for his troubles. Yato and Yukine leave, but Hiyori stays behind to ask about Kofuku's earlier comment regarding Yato being a scary god. Kofuku then explains that Yato once killed a shinki and also has killed humans in the past as well, whilst making a scary expression. And then Daikoku explains that the lesser known gods had to grant the kinds of wishes they received in order to continue existing, no matter who they were from. Shaken, Hiyori catches up to Yato and Yukine and asks Yato why he brought her to see Kofuku. Yato then informs her that if anything ever happens to him, she should go straight to Kofuku and Daikoku, to which Hiyori agrees. As Yukine is sitting at the edge of the lake, he is interrupted by the sudden appearance of Nora, a stray Shinki who reveals that she is Yato Shinki as well, and that she'll always be waiting for him to call her name. Borderline Yato teaches Yukine how to draw a borderline, a power that only Shinkis can use. A borderline is a barrier that serves as a Shinki shield and the only weapon, and phantoms cannot cross it. Yato notes that Yukine created a remarkably strong one on his first try, and first out of all the Shinki he knows. Hiyori then tells Yato that she has decided to look after Yukine due to the fact that she believes he is too negligent and irresponsible to care for him properly. After a brief tug of war, Yukine goes with Hiyori to her house, where Hiyori manages to sneak Yukine into her house and into her brother's room since her brother is much older than her and has left home already. As she is gloating over her success, her parents come home with Yato right behind them. Yato successfully infiltrates Hiyori's house, much to her irritation, and steals some food and drinks before taking his leave. Hiyori confronts him outside, and when Yato asks her how Yukine is taking his change in housing, she angrily replies that she's delighted not to be sleeping in an old shrine anymore. Yato then explains that sleeping in shrines keeps them safe from phantom attacks, since night is a time of devilry for the creatures from the far shore. He then informs Hiyori and Yukine is, in fact, afraid of the dark. This statement is proven to be true when Yukine knocks on Hiyori's door later that night after her father comes into his room and turns off the lights. Hiyori invites him into her bed to calm him down, but this results in Yukine having dirty thoughts and nearly groping her, although he is stopped and confronted by Yato. Yukine gets angry and claims that Yato doesn't need him anyway since he already has Nora. Bisha Monten and her Shinki are then shown patrolling the city. With the help of her navigator Shinki, in the form of an earring, 
She easily takes out three large phantoms before disappearing into the night. The next morning, Hiyori and Yukine go shopping. Hiyori offers to buy him a pair of gloves, but Yukine declines and says that he can just borrow anything he needs, and demonstrates this by taking a skateboard off the wall and riding it around the store. Hiyori quickly stops him and reprimands him for stealing, tell him to just ask her if he wants anything, but Yukine runs off. Yato appears in the store and asks Hiyori if she's really been looking after his shinki, repeating his earlier statement that gods and their shinki share mind and body, and that he gets stung every time Yukine misbehaves. Hiyori asks if it works the other way around, but Yato informs her that the pain only goes in one direction. He goes on to say that the connection between gods and their shinki help gods distinguish between right and wrong, but gods can still do whatever they please, including hurting or killing people, and that someday Yukine will receive his punishment. This reminds Hiyori of Kofuku's statement about Yato having once killed the shinki, and she runs off to find Yukine, dropping her body in her haste. Meanwhile, Yukine realizes that the sun has begun to set, and runs to find some place to escape the coming darkness. However, he sees a little girl crouched on the corner of the street and stops. No one pays any attention to her, and Yukine realizes that the girl is a spirit who was recently killed in a hit-and-run accident. The girl sees Yukine and runs to him, begging him to stay with her until her mother arrives, and he reluctantly agrees. Night arrives, and Yukine and the girl are still sitting and waiting for her mother. He finally tells her that her mother isn't coming, and she runs off crying. From the darkness, a group of phantoms call out to her and tell her that she'll find her mother if she goes to them. Casting aside his fear of the dark, Yukine runs to the girl and creates a borderline between them and the phantoms, only to find that the girl has already been infected. The darkness swallows both Yukine and Hiyori, who try to save him, but both are rescued by Yato. Yukine begs Yato to help him save the little girl, and the latter agrees. However, Yukine is horrified when Yato cuts off one of the phantom's legs instead. Yato tells Yukine that the girl has been completely consumed, and the only way to save her is to kill her. Yukine cries as Yato slashes through the phantom, killing it and releasing the spirit of the little girl. Scary person. Yukine is lying in bed, upset after Yato had used him to kill the little girl instead of saving her. Hiyori leaves Yukine cookies and hot chocolate at his door. However, when he looks at them, he imagines a phantom in it and runs away. He goes to the mall to express his anger after he recalls the events as to why he's upset. While expressing his anger, he decides to steal a skateboard, which then stabs Yato. Hiyori is looking out for Yukine, thinking about how Yato had not come for Yukine since that night, and runs into her friends, Aki and Yama, who tell her that she should be studying due to her tendencies to fall asleep in class. She then asks them if they'd seen a boy in a parka, Yukine, to which they both respond by teasing her. While Yukine is skating, Yato stops him in his tracks and asks him where he got it, to which he tells him that Hiyori bought it for him. Hiyori then appears, lying for Yukine, saying she bought the skateboard for him. While talking about the fiendish hour, a god named Bishamon appears with her lion shinki Kuruha and starts attacking Yato and Yukine, using another shinki called Kinuha, who is in the form of a whip. The two run away from Bishamon, who chases them using a tracker which appears as a flower earring, who is another shinki called Kazuma. Yata reveals that Bishamon's weapons, clothes, and even the lion are all actually her shinkis. Hiyori, worried about Yato and Yukine, goes to Kofuku and Daikuku and tells them about how Yato is being attacked. Together, the three of them track Yato's presence through Hiyori's ability to detect Yato's scent. While Yato and Yukine are resting from being chased, Yukine asks Yato if he really killed Bishamon Shinki, to which he replies he did. Yukine then questions whether Yato still needs him, seeing as he also has Nora. While arguing, Bishamon finds them and attacks them again. Kofuku then appears, stopping the fight by summoning her Shiki, Koki, and opening a vent which phantoms fly out from. Bishamon uses the distraction to have Kuraha attack Yato. However, Nora then appears, binding Kuraha and giving Yato a chance to get out of Kuraha's attack cutting Kuraha's eye, which enrages Bishamon, who summons Kazuma to tend to his wound. Kazuma, now summoned in his human form, stops Bishamon in her tracks, saying that the phantoms might try to devour her. She decides to retreat, telling Yato to not get any more blight, and Kazuma stares at Yato from the distance, bows, before following Bishamon. Later, Yato is seen trying to cleanse his blight, but is unable to. 
Nora then appears telling Yato that he can always use her. Uncertainty, destiny. Bishamon is seen talking to Kazuma about the vent that Kofuku opened a week earlier. Bishamon then asks Kazuma about the whereabouts of Yato, to which Kazuma ignores and changes the subject to the battle and how she had little regard for her Shinki in the battle. She then gets out of the spring and says that they need to hunt the phantoms that were released because of her. Bishamon Ten then calls her Shinki, and they leave to hunt the phantoms. Hiyori goes to Yukine's room to give him food, only to find Yato on the bed, eating, and finds out that he left to see Tenjin. Hiyori then visits Tenjin and asks him whether Yukine had been there, to which he said that he had been, to ask Tenjin to take him as his own Shinki seeing as Yato already has Nora. Yato is then seen at the spring well, using the water to cleanse his blight and fill a bottle, remembering what Nora had said to him after his battle with Bishamon. Where she said that he could always use her and that he should get rid of Yukine. Hiyori is on a rooftop thinking about what Tenjin said when she sees Bishamon and slowly backs away to leave, only to be discovered by Kazuma, who has worked out that she can see him in gods, but he chooses to keep this a secret from Bishamon when she appears in front of him, as they discuss the possible whereabouts of more phantoms that were released from the vent. After Bishamon leaves, Kazuma releases Hiyori, and tells her that if she values her life, she should stay away from Bishamon. He then tells Hiyori that if nothing is done about Yukine, Yato will die. Hiyori asks why Kazuma cares, to which he replies that Yato is his benefactor. Yato appears behind Yukine as he is badmouthing Tenjin after rejecting him as a Shinki, to which Yato laughs and then tells Yukine that they have a job. This later turns out to be helping out at a convenience store, to Yukine's anger. Daikoku and Kofuku appear with Hiyori, asking for him to do a job that isn't his or Kofuku's style of work, slaying phantoms. Yukine, who has been feeling that Yato would choose Nora over him, is caught trying to steal some charity money and runs off. When Yato leaves to look for him, Hiyori follows him, telling him that he needs to treat Yukine like an actual person, not just as a shinki. Nora appears to Yukine, talking about his eyes and how the color resembles of the fruit of that of the hawthorn plant and telling him how they're bland, with no sweetness, nor bitterness. Yato then appears with Hiyori, taking Yukine with him as a phantom appears, running off with Hiyori behind him. Whilst fighting the phantom, Yukine's thoughts are back, thinking about what Nora said, which causes his blade to dull, making it difficult for Yato to beat the phantom in one hit. Yato then pours pure spring water on the blade so that he can cut through the phantom. After Yato slays the phantom, Nora is standing in an alleyway as Rabu appears, telling her that Yato rejected her and that he's no longer worthy of his reputation. Over the line. Hiyori is in the girls' bathroom, remembering past events when Yato and Yukine randomly teleport into the bathroom, to which she then throws a roll of toilet paper at and beats. Yato then explains that they were summoned for a client who happened to be in the stall next to where they teleported. As Hiyori sees this, she gets even angrier and beats him too. Manabu Ogiwara, who is enduring bullying from his peers, explains his suffering. Yukine starts to feel anger and jealousy. Yato points out the fact that Yukine shouldn't be getting angry, as Yukine had endured that kind of bullying himself. Yato offers Manabu his aid by handing him an unseen object. Yukine then begins to roam around Hiyori's school, somehow remembering very slightly some aspects of his past. He finds a school jacket, wondering whether he used to wear one in his old life. Yukine then finds himself cornered in a classroom full of students, chatting away happily and playing games. As he looks at what they're playing, he sees that they had the same interests as himself, and listens wistfully as they talk about their families and their plans after school. Yukine tries his best to fit in, but he remains unnoticed. At Kofuku and Daikoku's place, Kofuku is gardening whilst Daikoku is cooking when Bishamon Ten and Urshinki arrive, asking for Anguri. As Kofuku is divining where vents will open, Bishamon Ten's Shinki, Kuraha, Akiha, Kuniha, Tsukiha, and Kazuma talk about Kofuku and how her readings are almost spot on where a vent will open. Kazuma then comments on how there are more vents than there are normally. Bishamonten asks Kofuku if she sees Yato regularly, to which she responds quickly without hesitating. Kofuku then threatens Bishamonten, stating that if Yato gets harmed, Bishamonten had better be prepared for a lot of storms. After Bishamonten leaves, Daikoku hugs Kofuku, saying how he's fallen for her even more. Manabu eventually confronts one of the bullies, clutching the item that Yato gave him in his pocket. 
a phantom begins to overtake Manabu, edging him on to kill and murder the bully for all the suffering he caused. Manabu throws a box cutter to the bully, indicating the will to fight. The phantom gradually possesses Manabu further until he remembers that Yato told him, only use it if you wish to stop being human. He suddenly comes to a halt while he runs off in fear. Hiyori rushes up to the easy Manabu as Yato is impressed that Manabu managed to hold back. He expresses his feelings as Yato says, you only need one friend, someone completely unique. This is enough to motivate Manabu to get himself together. Hiyori, however, is still worried, but Yato assures her that everything will be okay. Meanwhile, Yukine is sitting alone, watching with envy at all the smiles of everyone. He begins to cry, expressing his feelings. He notices a bunch of people laughing and talking. He's desperate to join them, but the fact that he's dead, has no memories, and is not easily seen stops him in his tracks. He trips over a metal bat and grabs it. He slowly walks up to the windows and gazes at his reflection. Remembering what Nora had said to him, this causes him to smash the window to pieces. In his anger, he smashes all of the windows one by one. As Yukine is destroying the windows, Yato is on the ground in intense pain, having been horribly blighted by Yukine. Hiyori picks him up and carries him on her back, approaching Yukine after she notices him standing there. Hiyori explains to Yukine the blight that Yato has been suffering as Yukine tries to act innocent. Hiyori tells him that he must come with her to get help from Kofuku and Daikoku. When they reach Kofuku and Daikoku's house, Hiyori begs for their assistance. Instead, Daikoku places a borderline to block them from reaching himself and Kofuku. Hiyori pleads that they let them in, but Daikoku refuses to allow them inside. Name Daikoku puts up a borderline upon seeing Hiyori and Yato in their blighted state. Hiyori pleads with Daikoku and Kofuku to let them through, and after a short pause, Daikoku only allows Hiyori to pass and tells Kofuku to cleanse her blight. While inside, Kofuku tells Hiyori that Yukine must be punished for Yato's blight to be cleansed. Afterward, Daikoku explains to Hiyori what Yukine's punishment is, ablution. Daikoku then leaves to request help from the other gods at their shrines. He arrives at Tenjin Shrine. The latter is shocked to learn of Yato's corrupted state. Most of Tenjin Shinki are frightened at the thought of performing ablution and the risk it involves. Mayu offers her help, but the others are reluctant. Daikoku thanks Tenjin and leaves to find the final Shinki needed to perform the ceremony. We then see Tenjin comment on the uncertainty of the ceremony and question Yukine's actions saying that Yato must slay him. Hiyori overhears a phone call in which Daikoku explains that he's struggling to find a third Shinki willing to take part in the ceremony. When Daikoku walks back to his car, he notices a mysterious figure for a split second who quickly vanishes. Upon hearing the phone call, Hiyori leaves. Determined to find one final Shinki, she initially thought of Nora but dismisses it after deciding that it would result in Yukine's death. Instead, she arrives at Bishamonten's shrine. Despite being scared, she shouts for Kazuma who is consequently interrupted during a meeting. Informed that a girl is shouting for him, but he ignores it. Hiyori continues to shout for Kazuma's help until she's pulled away, presumably by Kazuma. Kofuku is upset that Daikoku couldn't find a final Shinki to perform the ceremony. Daikoku comments that no one wants to help a god that they've never heard of. Yukine attempts to walk away, much to Daikoku's dismay, but is ultimately stopped by Kazuma. Everyone is surprised that the most trusted Shinki of Yato's nemesis would come to his aid. Kazuma comments that he owes Yato and that Hiyori came to him personally, which would have resulted in her death if Bishamonten found her. Kazuma checks on Yato, who is nearly completely corrupted, and urges him to revoke Yukine's name and banish him, but Yato refuses. He asks Yukine what he did, but he is dismissive and says that he hasn't done anything wrong. Daikoku tells him to take off his shirt. It is then revealed that Yukine has been corrupted by phantoms on his back. Yukine is scared and cries for help, at which point the ablution begins. He is enveloped in a bright light and his eyes begin to glow red. He is clearly in immense pain, which Yato has to endure too. Daikoku tells him to admit all his sins, but he just threatens to kill them, and his corruption grows, causing wings to sprout from his back. The three Shinki all increase their borderline power, causing both Yukine and Yato more physical torture. He admits he has done some bad things, but shows no remorse or responsibility for his actions, 
blaming it on his envy for the living, and it appears he has given up all hope, accepting that he is all alone. His corruption begins to grow, causing Mayu and Kazuma to lose hope, the latter requesting that Daikoku change into Koki and kill Yugine, but Daikoku doesn't give up. The corruption nearly envelops his name completely. Yato knows he needs to call his name before it disappears completely, but he is too weak. Suddenly, Hiyori pleads with Yukine not to give in, but she is knocked down. She quickly gets back up and reminds him of Yato and everything he has endured and that he has not given up, akin to a father. She tells him if he continues, then they can't be friends anymore. The corruption pauses, and Yukine is not gone yet. Yato struggles but tells him that although he can't interact with the living, he has been given a name so that he needs to live. Yukine's name suddenly glows profoundly, and as he begins to break down, the corruption clears as he admits all his wrongdoings and repents. The morning after, everyone is looking exhausted. Yato and Yukine said that they were relieved to be alive, to which Kofuku ironically responds that they're already dead. Yato thanks everyone for helping. He and Yukine apologize to Hiyori, and Yato begins to think about how he would be dead if not for her. Hiyori gives Yato and Yukine a big hug and starts sobbing, saying how glad she is that they're both safe. Regarded with hate. Yukine has a part-time job working for Daikoku, trying to pay back the money he stole and also earn money for him, and Yato, who doesn't work often. He wants to borrow Hiyori's old school book so he can teach himself what other kids his age are learning, which causes Yato and Hiyori to start crying in happiness. Kofuku then comes and tells Hiyori that she owes them 10 million yen for asking her to help Yato twice, though Yato manages to get Hiyori a discount of 90%, leaving Hiyori with 1 million yen left to pay, to which she then attacks Yato, telling him that he needs to help her pay. Yato visits Tenjin to thank him for his help, where Tenjin and Yato get into a verbal war. Mayu, Hiyori, and Yukine walk off from the group and talk about how one of Tenjin's other Shinki is missing, Miyu. Mayu then reveals that she was banished for stinging Tenjin due to self-harm, and tells Yukine that what happened to him is very contagious. Yato walks up to Tenjin and tells him how he promised Hiyori he would fix her condition, where she constantly slips out of her body at random moments, now being a fully determined fix-it after she saved his and Yukine's lives. Tenjin suggests that Yato cut his ties with her, believing that their connection gives her too much focus in the far shore. Severing them may help cure it. Hiyori and her two school friends agree to visit a shrine for a New Year's gathering. While Yato and Yukine are working a cleaning job, she calls up and invites them both to join her later for the first shrine of the day. On her way to the meeting place, Rabo and Nora are seen on top of a building, watching her, with Rabo contemplating killing her. Once at the gathering, Hiyori falls into her phantom form and wanders off, chasing after who she thinks is Yato. Meanwhile, Yato and Yukine get another request to slay some stray phantoms, which quickly escalates into a full-scale fight against them. Nora confronts and attacks Hiyori using some wolf-like phantoms. After evading the attacks until dawn, the phantoms disappear, leaving a scary conversation between the two girls. Yato and Yukine finish up with the scorpion-like phantoms and head off to the shrine gathering. Rabo, watching from the roof, satisfied with his ambush on Yato and Yuki, now has a much better understanding of Yato's abilities. Once reunited with Hiyori, Yato and Yukine are shocked to find that she has no memories of them both. Abandoned God As Yato and Yukine try to figure out how to restore Hiyori's memories, they are confronted by Nora, who reveals she has stolen Hiyori's memory of Yato, and has once again become Furuhime, Regalia of Rabo, who attacks Yato in an attempt to awaken some repressed memories. As Yato finds himself unable to beat Rabo and Furuhime, the two take their leave, with Furuhime stating she will return Hiyori's memory if Yato can defeat Rabo. It is revealed that Rabo is a god of calamity, a god who answers malicious wishes to kill people, phantoms, and gods, who once worked alongside Yato, who was also a god of calamity himself. As Yato became conflicted over whether restoring Hiyori's memory is the right thing to do, Yukine shows Hiyori a picture book detailing the times they have spent together. Meanwhile, Furuhime reveals that Hiyori's memory is further waning, shown when she loses her memory of Yukine and will leave her as an empty vessel if nothing is done. Despite knowing the risks involved, Yato and Yukine resolve to restore Hiyori's memory. 
As Yato and Yukine visit Hiyori to tell her they'll get her memory back, she grabs onto Yato as he teleports himself and Yukine away, leaving her on the ground. Scrap of a memory. Rabo comments on the condition of his shrine and how he and Yato are gods of calamity. Yato, Yukine, and Hiyori appear below him and Furihime. After recovering from their shock of seeing Hiyori who had followed them, Yato tells her to leave. He then charges at Rabo with Seki. The two exchange blows before Rabo traps Yato in a water bubble. Yato attempts to escape, but is unable to free himself. Hiyori grabs him and pulls him out, and Yato yells at her for not running away before thanking her. Yato attacks Rabo, and Rabo asks where the old Yato is. As they fight, Rabo notices Hiyori and attempts to kill her, but Yato and Yukine block him before he can. The three of them run away. Yato orders Yukine to take Hiyori and escape since he was the one Rabo wanted. Yukine objects since that would leave him unarmed. Rabo appears above them and holds up the orb containing Hiyori's memories. He throws the orb and Yato runs after it, but Rabo slices it before he can catch it. Hiyori collapses, as a result, angering Yato. He summons Seki once again and cuts Rabo, kicking him across the pond. The two fight with renewed force until Rabo absorbs the storm, merging with the phantoms. During the battle, he causes a landslide which threatens to crush Hiyori, but Yukine warns Yato who saves her in time. Hiyori's consciousness picks up Yato's smell, which allows her to wake up, regaining her memories. After kicking Yato out of embarrassment, she's dragged to Rabo who tries to kill her. Yato tells Yukine that they need to take him out, but Yukine worries they'll hit Hiyori. Yato reassures him by saying it's just like a borderline, and he can choose who dies and who doesn't. They defeat the phantoms inside Rabo and free Hiyori. Rabo raises his sword to attack, but Yato strikes first. Rabo drops to the ground. After seeing his face, Yato realizes Rabo used a curse to stay alive. Rabo then talks about how gods of calamity are always forgotten and how he'd wanted to be killed by Yato, who knew him. His body vanishes, and Bishamon Ten and Tenjin sense his death. Afterward, Nora laments about her failure, and goes to discuss it with Father. Yukine asks Hiyori if she actually got her memory back and how she did it. She starts to answer, but changes her mind and claims she couldn't remember. Yato walks up to her and suggests she cut her ties with them, saying she'd have a happier life. She refuses. Later, telling the story to Kofuku and Daikoku, Yato says she's just being stubborn, but Hiyori says she wants to be with them forever. The other two are amused and start jumping around, calling for celebration, and Yato promises to make her wish come true for 5 yen. Bearing a posthumous name Bishamon Ten has a nightmare about her past involving how Yato killed off all of her Shinki in the past with the exception of Kazuma. This acts as fuel for her revenge to the present day. Yato and Yukine go on a job with Hiyori to take care of a baby. However, they are soon attacked by an Ayakashi. Yato realizes the Ayakashi is the result of the baby's loneliness, and the baby is reaching out to its reflection for company and has Yukine cut the shadow in half. The three of them then go back to Kofuku's home, where Hiyori tutors and teaches Yukine. She determines him to be about a year younger than her, having most likely died in his second year of middle school. Yato tells them not to worry because soon he will hit it big now that he has a new good luck charm until Hiyori points out that it's just a plastic ripoff. When Yukine asks how much it costs, he replies 200,000 yen, causing both Hiyori and Yukine to beat him, the latter of whom complains that he and Yato wouldn't have to live off bread crusts with that much money. Later. As Yato and Yukine wander around town, they hide from Bishamon Ten. Yukine wonders how long they will have to run from her, but Yato doesn't answer. Bishamon Ten doesn't notice them, but instead a Shinki who is being attacked by Ayakashi. Kazuma tells her to leave since she has too many Shinki already, but Bishamon Ten says that she can't because she has already failed to save her once. She rescues the Shinki, uses Akiha the knife to remove the impurities in her body, and takes her to the palace where she names her Mineha. Later, Yukine wanders around the town and becomes depressed that no one has noticed him. As he sulks, a boy named Suzuha comes up and talks to him, introducing him as a fellow Shinki. This makes Yukine happy, as he can now make a friend, until he learns Suzuha is one of Bishamon Ten's Shinki. Bishamon Ten begins to feel ill from adding another Shinki, and Kazuma worries for her, but she tells him that she's alright. After he leaves, 
Kugaha, her Shinki doctor, arrives and tells her about a rumor of Kazuma helping with Yato's ablution. However, she laughs it off as just a rumor. Hiyori leaves Yato and promises to come tomorrow and that she won't leave him alone until she fixes his body, causing him to worry a little for the future ahead. One of her memories. Kugoha meets with Nora while he goes to find roots to make medicine and tells Nora he thinks Yato will be useful. Meanwhile, Yukine has something important to tell Yato. He's made a new friend! Yato tells this to Tenjin who says that Yukine is becoming a fine man despite having Yato as a master. Tenjin gives a job to Yato involving killing some Ayakashi, and after they're done, he rushes to see Suzuha. Yukine becomes friends with Bishamonten's Shinki Suzuha, since Suzuha is unaware Yato is Bishamonten's enemy. He helps Suzuha plant some flowers and tend to an old cherry blossom sakura tree. While taking care of the plants and trees, Yukine talks to Suzuha about his god Yato and how he's annoying and always taking his money, prompting Suzuha to happily laugh saying the two have a great relationship, much to Yukine's annoyance and confusion. Suzuha says that he has not spoken to his god for decades, and then proceeds to talk about his friend Tomoko. Tomoko was a young girl that often visited the area every summer to see her grandmother, and every year they would bump into each other. While Suzuha would remember her, she would always forget him. One summer, she promised to see the cherry blossoms on the cherry blossom tree bloom, but she never came again. He continued taking care of the tree, hoping that even if she couldn't remember him, she would remember the tree. This causes Yukine to confide in Yato that he wonders if Hiyori will forget them. Later, while Suzuha is alone, Kuguha comes and tells him how he is so pitiful because he's abandoned both by Tomoko and Bishamonten and puts Ayakashi on him, killing him in the process. The next day, Yukine goes on a picnic with Hiyori to introduce her to Suzuha. They wait, but Suzuha never comes and they notice Yato hiding in the bushes, spying on them, prompting Hiyori to throw him in the river. Bishamonten realizes Suzuha has died and asks his new friends if they know what has happened to them, but they smile and they say they haven't, so they don't blight her, despite not knowing where he is and being worried themselves. She then sees Suguha's hair cut short and asks what happened, but she says nothing, when it was Aiha who did it out of spite of Suguha's usurping her position as Bishamonten's battle clothing. Kazuma notices Bishamonten's medicine intake has increased along with being blighted, and arranges a secret meeting to see who has blighted her, but everyone, including Kuguha, comes clean. Later, Bishamonten awakens and shows that she's clean, relieving everyone. Kuguha meets Yato in the middle of the night and attacks him with Ayakashi, but even unarmed, the Ayakashi are no match for Yato, who proceeds to beat Kuguha. He tells Yato that he has a strong bond to the near shore despite having no shrine and to not die before they meet again, prompting Yato to yell that he won't be forgotten as long as someone remembers him, prompting him to think of Hiyori. False Bond It is revealed that Aiha is the one who blighted Bishamonten previously, and she was given medicine by Kuguha to hide it. She says it came back and that it comes from her jealousy of Tsuguha, who now acts as Bishamonten's foremost clothing, when Aiha used to hold that position, and how she just wants to be loved by Bishamonten. Kuguha offers to help heal her blight so no one finds out. Later, Yato spies on Hiyori to ensure her safety, but she tells him not to since she will visit every day and promises not to forget him, causing him to ask how much of what she says is true. Kazuma speaks to Kuguha, who reveals that Bishamonten is not feeling well because Suzuha died causing Kazuma to doubt his ability as her exemplar since he didn't take notice of Suzuha's death. Suguha later tells Bishamonten he saw Suzuha and Yukine together, shocking her. Yato suggests Yukine stop going to see Suzuha altogether. Yukine refuses and distracts Yato with a snack while Yukine goes to meet his friend. Instead, he sees Kazuma and some flowers and questions him on what has happened. As Kazuma leaves, Yukine grabs onto him, inadvertently going to Bishamonten's palace. There, Bishamonten sees Kazuma conversing with Yukine. Yukine begs Bishamonten to tell him what happened to Suzuha, and Kazuma reveals he was killed by Ayakashi. Yukine then calls Bishamonten a failure as a god, since she couldn't protect her own Shinki, and living as her Shinki must be hell. This causes her children Shinki to cry, blighting her as a result. She proceeds to ask Kazuma if what she heard was true about Kazuma helping Yato with his ablution, saving him. She shoots Yukine and Kazume, draws a borderline against her, protecting Yukine. In a fit of rage, Bishamonten exiles him. 
While Kuguha watches from above, he is delighted things are going according to plan, even if Kazuma wasn't revoked. Everyone is depressed about Kazuma's exile, while Tsuguha tries to cheer them up by saying he only navigated, it is revealed that he was their backbone, and he controlled their output, what got killed and not killed, and directed their movements, and without him, their powers are uncontrollable and unpredictable. Kazuma finds a safe haven with Kofuku and Daikaku. They talk about how Suzuha was murdered, and Yato implies someone from the outside murdered him. He walks Hiyori home, and the two are ambushed by Aiha, using a stick imbued with dark magic, but Yato easily overpowers her. While he is distracted, Kuguha kidnaps Hiyori. Kazuma tries to intervene, but fails as Kuguha cannot be bound, as he is revealed to be a stray, and he easily knocks Kazuma out. Yato returns only to find Hiyori's unconscious body. Wish Kukuha has kidnapped both Hiyori and Kazuma and placed them in a sacred imprisonment, preventing either of them from leaving. Yato has taken Hiyori's body to her family hospital, where they pray to God to help Hiyori recover. Yato, clearly angered, goes to Kofuku's house where he alerts Yukine to what has occurred. Yukine initially blames himself for not being there with Yato during the kidnapping, but then snaps out of it when Yato decides to go save Hiyori by confronting Bishamonten, who thinks he took her because of Kuguha. Daikaku tries to stop them to no avail. Kofuku tells Daikaku to bet on Yato while she bets on Bishamonten, as she believes that by betting on Bishamonten, the goddess of poverty can assure Yato's victory. She doesn't want to help by stopping Yato, because she knows if she does, it would only cause bad luck and possibly thousands of people to die. Yato and Yukine storm Bishamonten's palace and engage in battle with Bishamonten. Meanwhile, Kazuma and Hiyori try to escape their imprisonment to no avail. Kazuma then reveals to Hiyori that he was the one to beg Yato to kill the Ma clan because of the corruption within the clan. One day, one of the Shinki blighted Bishamonten, but they could not find the culprit, causing her condition to worsen. The Shinki began to fight over who blighted her, attacking and killing each other as a result. Kazuma, wanting to save Bishamonten, had heard of a god of calamity and runs to Yato, begging him to kill his clan. Yato, moved by Kazuma's devotion, uses Hiki, or Nora, to kill all of Bishamonten's Shinki. During the battle, three of her Shinki put a barrier around him, separating him from Yukine and leaving him vulnerable to attacks. Yukine, however, steps in to block Bishamonten's attack, being sliced in half in the process. Divine Acclamation, Imprecation Yato mourns Yukine's sacrifice, and as Bishamonten is about to land the finishing blow, Yato realizes Yukine's name hasn't faded and resummons Seki, who has now become a Hafuri Shinki. He is able to hold his own against Bishamonten, who begins to suffer from blight through Aiha, while Kukuha sends Ayakashi to feed on his fellow Shinki to cause Bishamonten pain while also getting rid of them. He reveals to Aiha that he is doing this because he got sick of this place as Bishamonten is not the god of war. She should be, and that he will kill her to reincarnate her and be her new exemplar. Aiha, guilty over what she has done, takes Kudaha to release Hiyori and Kazuma and tells them to save Bishamonten. They arrive in time to tell Yato the truth, but Bishamonten refuses to back down. Kazuma pushes Yato out of the way, taking the blow instead, and confessing to Bishamonten that he was the one who told Yato to kill all of the Ma clan to save her, causing her to break down and cry. She releases her battle Shinki, who has also suffered from blight due to being in contact with Bishamonten. What must be done? As Bishamonten mourns the loss of several of her Shinki, Yato calls Kuguha out. Kukuha claims what he did was for Bishamonten's sake as she was no longer the god of war she was supposed to be, and started naming several junk Shinki while pretending to have a big family, while hiding under smiles and how she brought everything, including the death of her Shinki on herself and that no one would follow her. Yato, annoyed with his words, chops off his hand, prompting Kukuha to back off. Angered by the loss of his hand, he sends an Ayakashi to attack Yato all the while taunting Yato as useless and a worthless god of calamity. Yato is not affected and dispatches the Ayakashi and proceeds to kill Kuguha. However, Bishamonten gets in between them. She talks to Kuguha about his feelings and if he felt what he did was right. He says he did everything for her and is not lying, as Bishamonten wasn't stung. 
Bishmon Ten says it may very well be her fault and looks back to when she first named Kukuha before finally releasing his name and sending him to the near shore. Bishmon Ten then proceeds to kill all the Ayakashi Kukuha sent around her palace. Yato decides to kill the Ayakashi as well, but Hiori says they should go home. Bishmon Ten finds her remaining Shinki in a well, cornered by an Ayakashi, and summons one of her Shinki, a rusty sword stick, to help her kill off the Ayakashi. Kazuma thinks back to the past and how he made the mistake twice. He awakens and asks Bishamon Ten to release him as her exemplar, as he has failed her twice, but she tells him it's alright to make mistakes since he's human, and she still wants him by her side and releases him of exile. How to Worship a God Yato, Yukine, and Hiyori successfully return from Bishamon Ten's mansion. At Tenjin's temple, Yato is reminded that he had made a promise to cut Hiyori's ties with himself. Hiyori arrives right in time for her placement exam and transfers from middle to high school. Later on, while discussing club choices with her friends, it's revealed that Yato has ignored his promise and did not cut ties with Hiyori. He pesters her about joining a Yato club while she decides to ignore him. The gods attend a colloquy in which they focus on Bishamon Ten's corruption and fall out with the Yato god. Bishamon Ten recognizes that it is her fault and that her actions were inappropriate, but refuses to bow down to the other gods with guilt. The colloquy also discusses the threat of the no masks and the conjurer. Ebisu, one of the seven gods of fortune, visits Yato after the colloquy and negotiates to buy Yukine, who is now a valuable blessed vessel. Both Yato and Yukine seem tempted to contemplate the offer when Ebisu offers them large amounts of money. Yato is given an advanced payment, which he promises Yukine will return to Ebisu. When they receive a call, they head out to find a man that pawned an old lady for money. When they cannot eliminate the small phantom, Yukine uses the money Ebisu gave them in order to make the phantom grow and then eliminate it. Yato proceeds to sulk, and Yukine explains how Yato wanted to get a temple with the money they receive. Hiyori then builds a miniature temple model for Yato, which deeply moves him and even causes him to cry. God of Calamity Ebisu tries to control Ayakashi using masks, but ends up getting blighted. Meanwhile, Yato is in great spirits because the shrine Hiyori made for him has been recognized as an official shrine by the heavens. All because Yato continued to pester them for several days to have it recognized, causing Hiyori and Yukine to worry about how lax the government system of the heavens is. This gives him perks such as being able to go to God's colloquies, selling god merchandise, getting a plot of land in heavens, and even being able to go to the heavens. Yato is happy and goes to the heavens to meet the neighbors while Yukine goes to Bishamon Ten to request Kazuma to teach him how to be a good exemplar, which Bishamon Ten allows and Kazuma agrees to. However, Yato is forced to leave Yukine after Nora calls him, going back to his darker line of work as a god of calamity which includes killing people on request. The sound of a thread snapping. Yato heads for the underworld with Nora, who transforms into a water blade and puts a defensive barrier around him. Later, Yama announces she has invited her crush to Capiburland on a triple date. She invites Hiyori and Ami, causing Hiyori to remember Yato, but her memory begins to fade. Mayu tries to call out to her, but Tenjin stops her, saying Hiyori should live her normal life. Meanwhile, all the gods are summoned to the heavens for an important meeting a colloquy. Kofuku asks Bishamon Ten if she knows where Yato is since she thought Yato would be at the meeting, as this would be his first as an official god, but can't find him. During this time, Yato ventures into the underworld. Nora instructs him to rub putrid water on himself to disguise his smell and warns him not to look into the eyes of the Ayakashi, as that will attract them to him. Nora then talks to him about the past, but Yato only thinks about returning to the surface. They are attacked by Ayakashi, but manage to find the sorcerer, who turns out to be Ebisu. Meanwhile, at the colloquy, the gods have determined that Ebisu of the Seven Gods of Fortune is a sorcerer trying to control phantoms and order his execution, much to Bishamon Ten and Okanenushi's protests. Yato and Ebisu introduce themselves, and Ebisu is protected by Yato as he continues to look at the Ayakashi. He tries to convince Ebisu to leave, but he says that he has come to see Izanami for a Lucushin brush in order to better control Ayakashi. He explains that while the idea of controlling Ayakashi with phantoms has merits, it continues to blight him because his invocations are imperfect. 
Then, both Ebisu and Yato are dragged to Izanami's dwelling place, where she takes on the appearance of Hiori for Yato. Ebisu explains that in order to lower people's guard, she takes the form of the woman closest to the viewer. Izanami tries to get them to eat food in order to trap the two of them in the underworld, but neither fall for it, since Ebisu has warned Yato not to eat the food there. She then tries to seduce Yato, but Nora snaps him back to his senses. Meanwhile, Hiori, Yama, and Ami are at their triple date with Fujisaki, Abe, and Seki. At first, Yama tries flirting with her crush, Fujisaki, but instead turns her attention to Abe upon learning that they are both fans of the visual K-band, Archfiends. Meanwhile, back in the underworld, Ebisu tries to negotiate for the brush. Izanami states that she is created to have friends who wouldn't run away. She becomes angered when she asks for one of the two to stay with her in exchange for the brush, which they both decline. She then puts forward an ultimatum. Yato and Ebisu will fight, and the loser stays with her. At Capiperland, the six have fun, but Hiyori begins to realize she's forgetting something important. Kazuma continues practicing with Yukine and is surprised at how Yukine has matured, restraining his concern for Yato to not blight him. As Yato and Ebisu fight, Yato asks why Ebisu reincarnates so much, and Ebisu explains controlling Ayakashi has killed his previous incarnations. Ebisu, in turn, asks why Yato exists, since he is a nameless god of calamity, causing Yato to strike back, saying he doesn't want to be forgotten, and just wanted to make them happy. Ebisu envies his ability to care for his life and tells Yato he can become a god that makes others happy. He manages to gain the upper hand, with Nora siding with him and becoming a gun. Just as it seems Yato lost, Ebisu uses a bat Ayakashi to steal the brush, revealing he was only fighting Yato as a distraction. Ebisu says goodbye to Izanami, addressing her as mother before he and Yato run away. Angered by the fact that she will once again be alone, she summons her Yamotsu Hisame to bring them back. As Hiyori shops for souvenirs, she sees Kappa keychains and decides to buy three, but begins to forget for whom she wanted to buy them. She begins to cry as she realizes she has forgotten something incredibly important. The six go to view the Capiper Lamb Parade, and the episode ends with Fujisaki kissing Hiyori. A certain desire. Hiyori runs away at the sight of Fujisaki, hurt at what he has done as she tries to wipe her lip to erase the memory of him kissing her. As she walks along the street, she hears Yukine's voice, who talks about how he has been training with Kazuma so he hasn't done the homework she assigned him, but she initially can't see him. She slowly begins to remember him and hugs him, relieved her memories are back. She goes to Kofuku's place, where she explains Yato is still missing, and Daikaku comes crying over how Kofuku hasn't appeared, which is strange since normally they try to send her away as soon as possible due to her bad luck. Yukine mentions how Kazuma has stated how all the gods are currently stuck in heaven. Hiyori decides to go search for Yato, realizing how little she truly knows of him, and how she is no different from other people since she nearly forgets him despite her promise to never forget. Meanwhile, Yato and Ebisu are being chased by Izanami's beldams. Yato asks if Ebisu can't do anything about her since he's her son, but he says that she abandoned him so it meant he means nothing to her. She manages to capture Ebisu, but Nora sacrifices two of his shinki, Tatsumi and Utami, in order to help them escape, much to Ebisu's horror and Yato's disgust. Yato wonders why father wants Ebisu to be saved, and Ebisu gives Yato the Lakushin brush, asking Yato to take it, and Kunimi, his only shinki with him left, to the outside world and meet up with Iwami since he feels he won't make it. Yato asks why he's so obsessed with becoming a conjurer, where Ebisu reveals his true reason is to control the Ayakashi, since the world is filled with endless chaos and needless death and he believes that by controlling Ayakashi, he can make the world a better place for humans, as he can prevent some of the damage of the Ayakashi. Yato, moved by this, decides that he doesn't have the same drive as Ebisu, and that he will save Ebisu, not for his father, but because he himself wants to. The two are then caught by Izanami. Yato cuts down Izanami's damsel while telling Ebisu to run. Hiyori tries to search for Yato in the history books but can't find anything about him and begins to wonder if Yato has a different name. Kazuma goes to Tenjin and explains the heavens are in disorder after Ebisu is discovered to be a conjurer and how strange it is the heavens are doing something about it now since they normally disregarded Ebisu's reincarnations. 
He asks Suyu, a plum spirit, to communicate with the trees in order to find out what is going on in the heavens. She's initially hesitant since it could put her master Tenjin in trouble until she realizes Kazuma is also worried about his master Bishamon Ten. She communicates with the trees, who say Ebisu is in the underworld along with a male god and a female Shinki with a paper crown, which they deduce to be Yato and Nora, which Hiori happens to overhear. Meanwhile, sentinels have locked up the six gods of fortune with Oshi, explaining it under the claim to ensure their safety, while explaining Ebisu is being punished for being a conjurer after they brutally interrogated his Shinki, many of which turned out to be Nora, and after investigating his estate and finding several phantoms and masks. Okinanushi is not satisfied and flies into a rage, becoming a monster spider, and Kazuma has knocked out all the sentinels except High Sentinel Oshi, who is dumbfounded. Hiori and Yukine sneak off to find Yato. Yato continues to stall Izanami while Ebisu runs, who reminds Kunimi to remember him and to thank Yato for everything. When he follows the scent of salt water in the hopes of an exit, but he ends up at a dead end. He remembers when he was younger how he was told by some heartless and insensitive Shinki how it didn't matter if he died because he would reincarnate, much to his horror. Hiori and Yukine make it to the entrance, but it has been sealed and cannot be opened. Yato has been captured by Izanami, but Ebisu decides to stay in Yato's place, since he has been captured by Izanami's beldams. He orders Yato to take Kunimi and the brush to Iwami since Ebisu is going to die anyway. However, Yato tells him he is saving Ebisu not for father, but for Ebisu, and instills in him the desire to live. Ebisu decides he wants to go back to eat dinner at Olive House, and Yato complies, the two running away. Yato suggests Ebisu use the brush to summon Ayakashi to open a vent to the outside, but only Ebisu escapes, as Izanami drags Yato back by tying her hair around his foot. Revival Hiori and Yukine notice the vent that opened and follow it. However, Kuguha captures her and places a bind on her. He nearly cuts off her hand to replace his own before Yukine comes to defend her. Yukine tries to bind Kuguha but can't since that's not his name anymore. Kuguha claims to have the upper hand, but Yukine tries to keep a cool head and fight him using borderlines. Kuguha manages to fight back, and Hiori shows surprise at how strong they are, causing Kuguha to laugh and say that he is weak despite being a blessed vessel. Kuguha rubs it in his face that Yato is with Nora, and that Noras are stronger because they have more than one name, and that's why people fear them. Hiori encourages him, saying Yato cares for Yukine, and that he is the one Yato has been waiting for a loyal Shinki that is his and his alone, with his blessed vessel status as proof of his loyalty. Yukine then manages to create a borderline so powerful it sends Kuguha into the river. The two head back to the source of the vent. Yato is dragged back, but he is happy he saved Ebisu, much to Nora's confusion with Yato hoping Ebisu hasn't died. A flashback occurs with Ebisu reading through books about himself, learning he has numerous names, and how he is like a Nora while asking Iwami about who he really is. Iwami tells him about his past as Izanagi and Izanami's firstborn, and how he was discarded before Ebisu wakes up and sees Bishamonten, equipped with Aiha and Kinuha, Kazuma and Kuruha. Bishamonten asks why Yato is in the underworld, but Ebisu can only ask them to help Yato before passing out. Izanami tries to drag Yato to her, but only grabs a shoe, much to his anger. Nora tends to Yato's wounds while they hide, pondering how she can stay calm during such a situation with her saying father would help them. Yato thinks how she has never been phased by anything ever since they were children, and it is good she is with him instead of Yukine, especially since he is so afraid of the dark, but then calls himself a scum for thinking such a thing. Yukine and Hiori try to enter the vent to save Yato, but Kofuku and Daikaku arrive, with Kofuku warning them they won't survive. Yukine offers his help to Bishamonten, but Kofuku says doing so would make him a Nora. He then begs them to save Yato, and Bishamonten assures him that she will save him without risking Yukine's name as Yato's blessed vessel while Kuroha attends to Ebisu's wounds. Bishamonten and her Shinki go to the underworld with help from Kofuku. Kofuku and Daikaku realize Izanami is trying to seal off all of the exits as the vents they open keep closing. Bishamonten follows Izanami's hair trail and fights Izanami to save Yato explaining she hated him because he saved her despite the fact that he was a nameless god and that she hated herself for not being able to save her Shinki clan and that she is saving him to repay her debt to him as he has now saved her twice. 
He calls her idiotic for risking her life, and because she will reincarnate before she tells him she won't reincarnate as she doesn't want to be replaced and they will all escape alive. As the others outside wait, Ebisu wakes up and mentions the only way to save him requires someone near the shore. Your voice calls out. Bishamonten continues her attempts to recover Yato from the underworld. Izanami captures her and separates Bishamon from Kazuma, but the war goddess is freed through the efforts of her regalia. Back in the world of the living, Ebisu recovers enough to suggest saving Yato using a method known as Soul Call. Hiori, as a person from the near shore, calls out Yato in Bishamon's name and is able to pull the latter out from the underworld. Heaven's punishers arrive to execute Ebisu, and the presence of event only angers them further. Bishamon asks that the punishers allow Ebisu to explain himself. However, Takamika Zuchi denies her request. They attack the group, but their efforts are foiled by Bishamon and a determined Ebisu. Hiori's continued efforts to soul call Yato are fruitless until she realizes that the second character of his name is not the katakana, Tu, but the extremely similar kanji, Boku. She screams out his true name, Yaboku, and Yato is pulled from the underworld, dropping Nora as he goes. Yato arrives in the world of the living without Nora and into the care of Hiyori and Yukine. Takemikazuchi sends Kiyun to attack them, but they are defended by Ebisu's phantoms. When he attacks again, Bishamon protects Ebisu from the lightning strike. She tells them to run and then rides Kuruha into the sky, where she and her Shinki battle Kiyun. With Kazuma's skill, they are able to seriously injure Kiyun, leaving him with a scar across his nose. Yato, Hiyori, Yukide, Ebisu, Kofuku, and Daikaku flee from the Punishers while Bishamon stays to fight. While they're escaping, Yukine scolds Yato for keeping his real name from them, feeling betrayed that Yato went to the Underworld without telling them, and worrying that Yato still does not trust him as his Shinki. Yukine reminds Yato that he swore to risk his name to protect him. Their conversation is interrupted by the formation of a pacification ring. According to Kofuku and Daikaku, this is an ancient art meant to quell enemies of heaven and would kill the target in one hit. Yato summons Seki, intending to fight on the basics that he still hasn't granted Ebisu's wish to eat another meal at the Olive Tavern. Yato and Yukine manage to cut through the pacification ring before the Punishers are able to kill Ebisu with it. Despite his efforts, the pacification ring simply reforms directly underneath Ebisu. Bishamon tells him to run but appears to be too late. The God of Fortune's Message Yato is seen in Kazuma's clothes as he takes a newly reincarnated Ebisu to the Olive House to eat. The episode takes us back to Hiyori and Yukine sitting on a bench contemplating what has happened and Yato's current condition before seeing Yato sneak off with Ebisu but not recognizing him. They then see Kazuma and Bishamonten approach them. Asking where Yato is as he escaped the hospital room they prepared for him, Ebisu is missing after he went to see Yato and Kazuma's room is a mess. Hiyori and Yukine realize it was Yato they saw with Ebisu and proceeded to follow. Yato comically remarks that the meal is being paid for through Kazuma's wallet that he stole along with his suit. Hiyori and Yukine catch up to them and watch them from outside. They then begin to talk about Ebisu's previous incarnation as Yato flashbacks to when he tried to save Ebisu by cutting the pacification ring. Ebisu asks why they are at the Olive House in the first place, and Yato says it was his previous incarnation's wish, prompting Ebisu to say Yato and he must have been good friends. Yato remembers how the pacification ring surrounded Ebisu, and he explains how he reincarnated often before Yato interrupts, saying he only knew the previous Ebisu. Ebisu begins eating, and Yato tries to get him to remember, but fails. Ebisu talks about how when he was born, he realizes he existed and fell in love with the town and the hardworking people, and how he wanted to help everyone by bringing them joy. He asks Yato if all gods are like that, but he can't answer. Ebisu then asks if he was a bad person since the heavens killed him, but Yato vehemently denies this, yelling that he was a wonderful god that would lay his life on the line for others and the type of person he could never be. He then remembers how the heavens succeeded in using the pacification ring on Ebisu, severely weakening him and cheering. Yato comforts him in his final moments as Ebisu thinks back to how the heartless Shinki say it's okay for him to die since he will reincarnate before Yato appears in the flashback of his childhood and asks if that is what he really wants and what will happen to his memories and current self. Ebisu cries, 
saying he didn't want to die before he explodes. Yato in the current then cries, breaking down and apologizing to Ebisu. Ebisu later goes to Bishamonten's abode to ask her to help hide Iwami, which she agrees to. She, Tenjin, and Okininushi then have a meeting where they discuss with Kunimi his new exemplar, what Ebisu was trying to do with him, explaining Ebisu was trying to control Ayakashi to make the world a better place, and the brush they went to the underworld to receive is gone, but the heavens most likely don't have it. Daikaku worries for Yato since he hasn't been eating, but Kofuku assures him that he will be alright since he has Yukine and Hiyori, and the three are strong together. Yato then takes Yukine for a stroll with Hiyori following, and he explains his past of killing people, but Yukine assures him that it is in the past. Nora interrupts, annoyed she was abandoned, but forgives Yato. Yato, however, has had enough and releases Nora with a flood of their childhood memories appearing before him. He then asks Yukine what he should do to change, and the two begin fighting Ayakashi, and Yukine assures him that he doesn't need to change and that instead of killing people, they would use their abilities to kill Ayakashi and slice chaos and disorder. Hiyori then claps her hands and prays for her wish of Yato becoming a god of fortune to become true, causing Yato to blush. After the credits, Fujisaki is revealed to be father and in possession of the Lakushin brush Ebisu went through great lengths to achieve. All the while watching Yato and snidely remarking how he's in a rebellious phase, but that he cannot escape him. Did you enjoy our video? Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.